Um, and that's the one thing that I really want you to pay attention to when we're out here doing ceremony, um, is to pay attention to the way the water re responds. Sometimes you'll just see it get real quiet on the surface and it'll get like glass. But it's just like where we're at, it'll begin to spread out. Um, sometimes um, the sunlight on the water, you'll see the sunlight on the water and all of a sudden everything will light up as you're, as you're sending these prayers and asking for us to come back into right relationship with the water and remember our stewardship. The water will respond and you'll get like these little fireflies. Not just the glistening of the water, but the wa you'll just get more sparkly um, that's coming through. And, it, and it'll go away and it'll come back as you, as, 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 in response to what you're saying. And um, so just pay attention. Um, and then um, the other thing you're going to notice, especially out here, not so much as it's harder in the cities, but um, the plant people will respond, the animal nations will respond because they haven't forgotten their original instructions of how to live in harmony. And we're the only ones who have. And so as we begin to walk that prayer and they feel that energy of love, respect, and gratitude for the water that they know they have, they have to depend on, um, they'll begin to respond. And so you'll see birds that just like fly right in front of your face or dragonflies that come and walk with you or you know any number of things, eagles, golden eagles, bald eagles we've already seen. Um, yesterday we were doing a, a blessing on a bridge and a duck flew right under the bridge, right under where we were tying the prayer tie for, uh, to carry that prayer, that prayer bundle to, to leave on the bridge and he flew right under that bundle and just right along the top surface of the water. And so, you know, they just, they hear and they respond in ways that, um, that if you're not really paying attention, you might not see. So, um, as you walk, uh, that's the one thing I want people to do is to really start to reconnect. Because the problem with our water really is that we've broken our connection to the water. We're, we don't see it as our source of life anymore. We've, we've come to it's our resource. And we expect to turn the tap and it just to be there. Um, we don't, we're not, caught, we don't, we're not carrying it anymore, which is why we're carrying it. Um, we're not physically carrying that water, even if it's just from the well to the house. Um, we're, we're not physically carrying it, so we don't have the same respect mm -hmm. that it's there when you turn that tap on. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, oh, years ago when I went to my first Sundance, I had saved $2,000 and I wanted to do something for an elder, and I decided I wanted to put a well in for somebody that didn't have a well. And these very wise young men at Sundance said, oh, we know the perfect person to take you to. And so they took me to this elder. And when we came upon him, he's got a stick across his shoulders and two white plastic buckets full of water um, balanced on those. And he's, you know, carrying his water. And uh, so they stop and put his water in the truck and put him in the truck. And we go back to his house. And they introduce me and say, she really wants to do something really nice for an elder. And she wants to put in a well. And we thought we, she should talk to you about putting in a well. And um, and he said, oh, wow, you want to make a well for me? And, she, and I said, yes, I'd like to do that so you don't have to struggle with the water. And, and he went, walked over to his buckets and he took two jelly glass jars off the counter. He had just one room. And <clears throat> he scooped up the water and he brought one back and he handed it to me, but he didn't let go. And then he said, I have friends in town. They have running water. And I go and they turn the tap on and let it run and run and run until it's cold but he doesn't let go of the glass. So I look up at him and he goes, me, I'm just glad it's in my bucket and I'll carry my, my water until I die because I'll always remember. And that was really, the, yeah, it really was. And so he convinced me that I needed to use the money to buy school supplies for the school. <laughs> and, and so, you know, um, I've been really blessed in my life. I wanted to ask grandmother Carol Bluber Blodgett organizer of the 2018 Water is Life Walks along the Housatonic River. And I wanted to know the excitement that she shares about organizing this walk and being on the rivers, walking with the water. She talks about the gifts that, are, that she receives by doing this work. And so my question is about you know, you invite so many people to join you in this walk and that everyone has an opportunity to receive these same gifts 
And I would love to hear in your words that story about receiving gifts because we're walking with the spirit of water. Oh, wow. Um, my, I, I love the song by, um, by Bob Seeger about um, by the river. And in that river, he says everything so succinctly as, as to how I feel when, I, when I'm down by the river. And, um, and that, you know, there is a rhythm and a flow. There is um, uh, a power that you just can't know. You, you can't see it. You can't feel it until you're right there with that. And um, there is this, um, this power of um, the seen and the unseen that makes itself visible. Uh, the other day we were um, saying the closing prayer and the sun was setting and so you had this what you know these beautiful sparkling um, uh, ripples on the water all being lit up by the the rays of the sun and so as I was saying this prayer and um, asking that we all come back to that understanding of our stewardship of the water it was at it was the visibility of the water responding because it looked like a million fireflies just lit up and all that sparkling and then they died down and every time i i would say something the water would respond to the words dr emoto has proven with his pictures that water does listen water does respond the same way our ancestors had always known and they taught me that you know, just watch the water, listen to the water, it will respond, it'll let you know if this is what you're, if the ceremony that you're doing is what it needs, or if it needs more, watch and feel that energy. But in that song that Bob Seeger um, talks about, there is this, um, this beauty of um, everything being so connected. And there's um, a patience, but there's indulgence too. And there's there's all of these contrasting things that are so visible. And nope, you don't have to be anybody special. You don't have to do anything special to feel that if you just come out and walk and just try to get connected, get out of that um, everyday um, um illusion world where we have to go to work and make some money to pay the bills that's all an illusion and so step into this reality of um you're part of a bigger whole and as insignificant as we are everything every choice that we make can be very significant um and so that's what i i want people to feel what i feel and and uh, understand how much water loves you and just love it back that's it that's all you have to do and um and so thank you deb i hope that answered your question yeah. but if i could just um reflect on what i witnessed today after feeding the river and watching um the wildlife respond and even the trees respond in such beauty. I was wondering if you could just like reflect with me on that. Yeah, and so we're offering we're offering food to the water because it feeds us, and so we're acknowledging the gifts that the plants give us. Um, you know, the, those medicine plants that grow in and around the waters, and and so acknowledging that gift of life that they give us in order for us to survive and none of that would be here without the water and so we're offering these things and the the duck just flies right under the bridge and and right along the very surface of the water right under where we were and then all the little um i call them helicopters spinning out of the trees and just right down into the water right where we're standing and so 
Um, and then we have a female cardinal come in. And I see this all the time where the, the wildlife just comes. It's, they feel and sense that change in the energy because they're water too. And they understand um, that they need that water. We, we're the only ones who have forgotten that interconnection. We're the only ones who have disconnected. And we just need to plug in again. And so thank you, Deb. Thank you, Grandma. You can wave or anything you want. <laughs> where, where are we? We are in um, No Bottom Pond. And what are we doing here? We're protecting the water. We're gathering the headwaters of the Green River. Trying to get the, to the bottom of it. <laughs> <laughs> bottom of No Bottom Pond. This don't make me laugh. I'm moving the camera too much. <laughs> Thank you, water protectors. Uh, I'm Rima Loeb from Plainfield, Massachusetts, and I'm on the uh, Housatonic River Walk. For me, it's the understanding that the water is the blood of my mother and grandmother, the earth, and uh, also that you know my my babies grew in that water and as we all, we all have, you know. Uh, at Standing Rock, it wasn't just a phrase. We came to understand deeply, water is life. It, it, it's simple. And uh, I guess I consider myself a water protector now. I, um, not much of a warrior anymore. <laughs> I, I'm 85 and I can barely move at times, but everything that I can do, that this is my, I guess I'd like to donate my elder years to serve my grandmother and to serve the children and grandchildren of the future and all of mother's children you know we are all relatives I can't tell you logically why I went I was pulled there I had to be there um, I of course it's Lakota territory I'm what they call Honka adopted Lakota I have Lakota grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and uh, so that's part of my family is, is there in, in South Dakota and, uh, and Nebraska and so forth. But I think that most of us went, who went there knew we had to go. When I left Standing Rock, it was, it was very hard after the indigenous women's ceremony, which by the way is the most beautiful women's 
event I have ever seen. Uh, the young indigenous women led that march and the men were so respectful. This is what real warriors are, real men. They stayed on the sides and the back and walked in prayer and with respect. And it, it was a beautiful, beautiful event. And two women walked crossed of, in front of this line of very angry looking police, military, security, and crossed right. We didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know. But they crossed in front of them, went down the hill to the water, went down to the Cannonball River and did a water ceremony. And then they came back, very calm, and we all turned around and returned to our camps. And uh, <coughs> and then it was raining then, and before the... Uh, evening was over, it was snowing, and they had just finished at Sacred Stone Camp, the Straw Bale Schoolhouse. And it was so beautiful. We were so proud of those people who built that, the men who went up on that roof and did the whole thing. It was, it was warm, it was beautiful, and uh, of course that was destroyed by the BIA at the end, and I, I consider that tribal council, and I'm, I'm not Lakota by uh, birth, but by my Hunka relationship, I am very close to my relatives, and what the tribal council did was wrong. They abandoned everyone. You know, they said, everyone come. All right, now the Army Corps of Engineers says that they're going to do a study, so you can all go home. They didn't get it. And I would like to have stayed through that winter, but my daughter was out there with her friends, and she said, Mom, you're coming back with us. <laughs> you're going to fall and break your hip, and you won't be any good to anyone. <laughs> And so, you know, I've learned uh, years ago, you don't uh, argue with a daughter. <laughs> and uh, so I went back, but in February, in February, my son uh, went out to bring a whole truckload of supplies, solar panels, food, clothing, everything that people needed. And uh, I said, I'd, I want to go with you. And we went back, and we stayed until, well, it was, I think, the 27th when we were driven out. I got very sick from, everybody said I had the dapple cough. The helicopters kept coming in. One helicopter would come in every morning when we were doing a women's water ceremony. They would come so low, like almost like they were going to land. We used to laugh at them and say, you know, why don't you guys come down and learn to pray? Come join us. But uh, it, uh, whatever I had, it, it was like nothing I've ever had before. I just coughed. I had a fever and coughed and coughed and coughed. So. When we were driven out of that camp, we went next door to Black Whoop Camp. And uh, the tribal council pulled the same thing on the woman who owned that land. They said, oh, we'll give you a, we'll give you a formal paper by April. You're driving us out at the end of February, you know. And uh, so I was huddled around a, uh, and they did ceremony there. And uh, my son uh, had his chinupa and, and uh, filled it, and they, they prayed and did a very beautiful ceremony, that much I remember. But a couple of days later, 
the uh, the, o- the owner of the land's son came to where I was sitting and by a, a stove, <laughs> old old house, and and uh, he s- said, "Is this your stuff?" I said, "Yes." He gathered up my blanket and everything and then took me by the other arm and he said, we have to go fast, they're here with guns. And we had already been told, the medicine people had said, no more front lines, they have guns loaded, they will use them. And you know, none of us wanted to see another wounded knee. There were children in our camp at Sacred Stone, you know. So. Uh, we left. <laughs> they think they've won. They're afraid of the prayer mm-hmm. and the unity.